So um, thank you everyone for uh, showing up today. Um, we're so excited to have Mikhail Owuna and um, his Infinite Essence series at Prizer. And we're so excited to have Mikhail here to talk about the series. Um, a little introduction, um, Infinite Essence is a photography series that recast the black body as the eternal cosmos. In the series, in the series, um, Awuna responds to pervasive media images of black people dead and dying and articulates an alternative vision of the black body, making visible the divinity inherent in, in blackness. You can see Infinite Essence at Pfizer every night, um, eight to 11 um, until May 8th. And, um, or you can, uh, make uh, an appointment uh, during the day, nine to five, Monday through Friday at the link um, at the link below that I think Carrie's gonna be dropping in the chat in a sec. Yep. <laughs> All right, and so um, without further ado, um, I'll, Mikhail, Mikhail Owuna is a queer Nigerian Swedish American photographer and engineer based in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania exploring the intersections of visual media with engineering, optics, blackness, and African cosmologies. His work seeks to educate and elucidate an emancip emancipatory vision of possibility that push in, pushes African people beyond all boundaries, restrictions, and frontiers. Awuna's work has been exhibited internationally at institutions such as the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, the Equal Justice Initiative and National Taiwan Museum. His work has also been featured in media ranging from the New York Times to CNN, NPR, Vice, and The Guardian. His first published monograph, Limitless Africans, was awarded the Photo Evidence Book Award with World Press Photos. Um, I will pass the mic on to you. Hi everyone, it is such a pleasure to be here tonight. Thank you all for having me. And, you know, I just wanted to first start by, um, again, thanking everybody. And today's gonna be very interactive. So I think there's a lot of material that people might not have exposure to. I'm gonna be discussing a bit of background about the African mythologies and cosmologies in the work. So feel free to jump in when we're talking to like ask questions, you can drop them in the chat. If you want, you can even, I'm not sure if there's like a raise hand function or something, or you can even just try to jump in and ask questions. So let's make it really interactive. Um, we have like a nice intimate group tonight. So I'm gonna just do a brief introduction about the series, about, about the vision for the work, share some photos, and then um, Lily and I are gonna transition into doing a facilitated conversation. So yeah, co questions throughout, let's keep it interactive and really open. So I'm gonna share my screen and hope that it works. Um, <laughs> Here we go. So yes, just to start. So the current series I'm presenting is from the, my, my body of work, Infinite Essence. Um, in case people haven't been to Prizer yet, just wanted to give a glimpse of what the nightly illuminations look like. And so these are on view from eight to 11 every evening up until May 8th. And so, you can see some of the works here on display. All of the images are reference specific myths and African legends specific to the Igbo in Nigeria, which is my ethnic group and the Dogon in Mali. So I'm gonna go into a bit more about the Dogon and the Igbo, uh, but just wanted to give a glimpse of the work here. This is the last image. So there are four images that are on display. They're nice and really properly illuminated as you're, you can see them right from the street view, very, very COVID friendly, you know, we're always concerned about that. And so the works are all printed on metal, which I'm gonna get into a bit later in the, in the series, but metal as a substance is connected to, is, is cast as a cosmic substance that connects us to the origins of the universe within African myth mythological systems. And there's strong, long histories of divine smiths and smithing and metallurgy traditions, which are encoded into the metal substance and metal substrate that, are, that were chosen as the printed media for the work. 
So to give a bit of just background before kind of jumping into the specific mythologies, one helps situate us geographically. And so the two groups that I focus on again are the Dogen in Mali and the Igbo in Nigeria. And so here you can see this is where Mali is and the Dogen live in Dogen country, which is right along the, um, the border with Burkina Faso. Um, along the um, along this really steep um, escarpment there. This is you can see here also is an image of their masking tradition. So this is from the Awa um, Society of Masks in Dogen country. I was really drawn to the Dogen in my research on African cosmologies because of the incredible documentation that we have around Dogen on Dogen understandings of the cosmos and the universe. The Dogen also have a ritual every about 60 years that documents and celebrates the, the orbital period of the Sirius system. And so Sirius, the star Sirius is the brightest star in the sky, that's Sirius A, but what we can't see without a telescope is that Sirius B is also rotating around the star. And the Dogen, without the use of telescopes, we're able to observe the orbital period and make observations of the weight, size, color, and composition of Sirius B for over a thousand years. And so I was really excited to you know, incorporate the Dogen into my research and they form a lot of the basis of the work that I do in this space. The other ethnic group that I focus on in my research is the Igbo in Nigeria. And so this is a personal aspect for me. So my family, a bit of the background that I have is I was born in Pittsburgh. My family's Nigerian and Swedish. Born in Pittsburgh, went back to Nigeria, came back to Pittsburgh when I was three, grew up and grew up in the United States. The, and so I came to learning more and more about our Igbo cosmological systems actually at the very outset of the series. And so when I was struggling with a lot of these images of state violence against black bodies, I was looking for a way to propose a visual response that would also combine my engineering background with photography. And I was really struggling. I mean, it's like a, it's a broad idea. Like I wanna reimagine the black body as a space of magic. That's how I started. And one of the really breakthrough moments for me was I was reading Chinua Achebe, the Igbo novelist who wrote Things Fall Apart. I was reading his reflections on the Igbo ideas of the cosmos and our cosmological systems. And one of the, in one of his essays, he wrote that the chi, which is the one of the Igbo concepts of the soul, is the chi just an infinite one of the an infinite ray, sorry, pardon me, is the chi a ray of the infinite essence of the sun. And so are each of our spirits being connected to something that's far greater and deeper than what meets the eye. And that phrase, infinite essence, became the grounding principle for the series and is, all, and is the title of the work as well. So I focus on the Dogen and the Igbo in my work. And so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna share a few images. I'm gonna share a few of the mythologies behind them. And then we're gonna open it up to a wider conversation. So the way I came into the work was in 2015, I was really affected by the murder of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, and how his body was left. He was shot and killed by, by um, Darren Wilson, a, a white police officer. His body was left in the street. And then the media took pictures of his body and shared it across the world without the consent of his family. And we see, I kept seeing again and again, this barrage of images of black death, um, George Floyd, Philando Castile, Tamir Rice, um, Antoine Rose Jr. I mean, there's so many names that we can't even keep track of all of them. And so I wanted to think about how could I, you know, fuse engineering and my photography practice to propose an alternative vision that could transfigure black bodies from sites of state violence into these transfigured transcendent vessels. And so each of these images are connected to specific myths. And so this image, for example, is titled the Nomo Semi, the Guardian of Space. And in the Dogen system, so the Dogen was the first ethnic group that I shared. In one of the mythologies, the Nomo Semi at the very beginning of the universe was sacrificed to purify the universe. And as he sacrificed, his blood forms the planets and the stars. And so you see here, 
the planets in these celestial bodies spooling forth from his back. He's then resurrected. And so within my work, I think a lot about these themes of death not being final, these themes of resurrection. And so the Dogen creator God then resurrects the Nomo. And as he's, and he's brought back to life, he turns with his arms, with which gesture his role as the guardian of space. So this is the Nomo Semi, the guardian of space. So I'm not sure if anybody has heard of the myth of the flying African, flying Africans, anybody? Um, so this is actually an African-American myth. And throughout the United States and particularly along the coasts of Georgia and South Carolina, there are stories that persist to this day of enslaved Africans who are able to escape bondage by taking flight and returning to their African homelands. There are a lot of hypotheses as to the origin of this myth, but many people point to an 1803 slave rebellion known as Igbo Landing in Georgia, where a group of enslaved Igbo people overthrew their captors aboard a slave ship. They drove the ship ashore, and right when they're about to be recaptured, they drowned themselves. They entered into the creek and they drowned themselves. And they said, the water spirit brought us, the water spirit will take us home. And they flew home into the metaphorical primordial blackness of the African creator gods. So this is the flying African. Within my research, I was really fascinated by African understandings of how our bodies are inextricably connected to the cosmos and the power of how that can be modulated through the acts of divination and ritual. So the title of this piece is Inekozo and it's dedicated to a female Dogen diviner and priestess in the mid 1900s in, in modern Mali. And she would, she would close her eyes and she would fuse the blackness of her inner worlds with the blackness of outer space. And so within African systems, we see this recurring motif that blackness is this generative force from which all life emerges. And so she would have these visionary ex experiences of celestial bodies. And in 1950, there's a documented report from French anthropologist Marcel Griol and Jeanne de Talent, where um, Inekozo um, documents the weight, size, composition, and color of the star Sirius B that I mentioned earlier which is a star that's impossible to detect without a telescope. And so again, these powerful ways in which black bodies have been able to connect from our, our contemporary bodies to the cosmos and the primordial. So this image is also featured in the current show at Prizer and the title of it is Ama's Womb. And in Dogen cosmology, one of the other pieces that's really, really fascinating is this kind of primordial androgyny from which light, all life emerges. So thinking about this primordial blackness, which is infinite and contains all possibilities within it, all genders, everything is contained within this blackness as this divine principle of the universe. And in the Dogen cosmology, the universe emerges from this blackness from the womb of the primordial creator god, Ama. And within his womb, he has these prefigured signs which encode all of the potentiality of the universes, universe from stellar bodies to the human fetus. And it's in this utter blackness that all beings await their gestation and form. So this one comes from the Igbo system. And so, one of uh, one of the one of the word the words in Igbo for human being is madu, and madu is a contraction of the words ma and ndu, which together mean literally the beauty of life. And so, what is the beauty of life? Um, in the, in our cosmology, we 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 believe that the beauty of life is in becoming a fully realized, spiritually enlightened individual. And so this is, this is why Imadu can also be seen as being the enlightened one. This is where we are deeply connected to and draw on the primordial blackness of the Igbo creator god, Chukwu. So this is Imadu, human being, or the beauty of life, which is shown by our connection to the primordial blackness.
so this is just to give you all a, a sense of actually how the photos are done, just like kind of jumping outside for a moment. So the way I begin the process is actually, I hand paint the model's bodies with fluorescent paints. So these paints are not really visible in the visible spectrum. So you can see maybe a dot here and a dot there, but not really very much. And so I studied engineering in college. And so I built my own flash that only transmits ultraviolet light, which you can see here. So the model is already painted with these fluorescent paints, but you can't see them in the visible spectrum. I turn off the lights, I click down on my shutter, and then a beam of ultraviolet light shoots out and interacts with the paints on the model's bodies. The model fluoresces, body, body fluoresces for a fraction of a second, and that light is then captured on the camera sensor. So this is actually how the images are created using that fact known as ultraviolet induced fluorescence. Where we move from the visible spectrum, where we have anti-blackness and white supremacy, to moving what beyond what's visible to the human eye, to where blackness is a divine cosmic principle of the universe from which all life and existence emerges. So I have to have a few more images and then we'll segue into the wider conversation. This one is from a Dogen myth of creation. Um, these are also, each of the, each of the ports are also done in collaboration with models. One of this, um, the model for this image was Derek Brockington, who's a, a dancer with Dance Theater of Harlem. And so here we are invoking the myth of Lebe, which is in, in his articulations. And in the Dogen system, Lebe was the first human being to die. And when he died, he was buried and then his body was consumed by a serpent. And then his body was then regurgitated. And it forms outlines of these colorful stones that created the outline of his body. And so this is the emergence of death into the universe, but also has this resurrection element to it, where then we're kind of reformatted into these, these colorful dots, colorful stones. And so his joints are, are form the outline of his body in these, in these stone formations known as covenant stones. And they become the focal point and they represent the most important parts of the human being in the Dogen system. And there's a sacred number associated with each of them. So here we are kind of thinking through the joints within the Dogen system. This one is from the Ebo system um, and thinking about how the fundamental elements of our bodies, you know, people talk about, oh, you know, we're all stardust. And this is actually, this knowledge was already encoded within African knowledge systems and spiritual science. And so I wanted to share this image to evoke that um, because it, and it's titled Okuna Miri, which is fire and water. And there's a powerful Igbo axiom that states that madu bu oka okuna miri, a human being is a synthesis of fire and water. So you can think of fire and water as being these cosmic elements that are born at the origin of the universe, the same elements that fuel the stars. And the ancient Igbo divined that the human body incarnated these same fundamental elements found in the stars and that we host quantities of both of these elements in our physical forms. So I have two more images. This one's also um, a preview of some of my uh, some of my emerging work. I'm going to have a new set of images from the Infinite Essence series that are going to be released this fall in a gallery show in New York. So here you can kind of just see a little bit more of the evolution of the actual visual language of Infinite Essence. And here within African systems, there is a recurring motif of twins and twinning. I twin you, you twin me. Um, and this image evokes the first two twins from the, from the Dogen system. And so these are, these are the divine Nomo twins, the Nomo Die and the Nomo Tetean. And together they play a central role in the cosmic structure and unfolding of the universe. And the last one I'll share is actually a self-portrait. <laughs> so in 2018, I did a self-portrait of myself for the series. And the, so I actually painted my own body. I set up a tripod and in total darkness, I had the ultraviolet flash going off again and again and again and taking images. And 
the with this with this image, I was evoking the own, my own ancestral legacies, and so the title is Dibia, which is the diviner and the healer within Igbo society, and for the Dibias undergo constant and rigorous training to expand their understanding of the universe. And I descend actually from a lineage of Dibias in Abagana, Nigeria. And with this self-portrait, I was working to pay homage to their work and extend their cosmic legacy in my own way through my photography. I apologize for the dogs. <laughs> And so just to show, um, you know, we started by showing some of the images at Prizer. Just wanted to share also some of the images like that are and also in larger format. So at Prizer, we have um, images at 24 by 36 inches, which is the smaller of my edition sizes. And this is at the larger size of 40 by 60. Um, so these are, again, these are aluminum metal plates, a cosmic substance that evokes the origins of the universe and our divine smithing traditions in West Africa. And these are two, we're two pieces were recently acquired by Duke University School of Engineering. And the last image is another one just showing some of the work in situ. These are again the larger, the larger sizes 40 by 60 and 40 by 40. And these were included in my first group exhibition in New York at the Ford Foundation Gallery. And it was a show titled Utopian Imagination where there were predominantly black artists, LGBT artists, responding to and with our work evoking a utopian future for our bodies so just wanted to end there and excited to engage in conversation thanks so much All right uh, right um so thank you so much michael for sharing that presentation and your photography it, i i keep looking at them and it's insane um that those are <laughs> photographs um what that means that that is a reachable reality um for lack of a better word and a little alliteration um so if anyone um so Mikhail and I will I'll be asking a few questions. Um, excuse my dog if you hear her in the background too. Um, we're a dog loving house. Um, and so if you have any questions, you're free to drop them in the chat. Or if you want to speak up, um, you're free to unmute yourself or um, drop in the chat like I'd love to ask a question. And um, that'll sort of be the virtual equivalent of raising your hand. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> but I guess uh, just to jump in and get started, um, I'd love to hear about how you came into photography and engineering. Mm, yeah, so, so I guess I can break it into two pieces. So I started engineering and studying engineering in 2008. I, at Duke, I double majored in biomedical engineering and history. And so I came in actually, I actually wanted to study biochemistry. And then my, my dad was like, oh, you need to study something more useful. So that's what I was like, that's the engineering that was happening was family pressure. <laughs> I wanted to study biochemistry. He was like, oh, that's not enough. Um, so um, I, I studied engineering and I started doing photography at the end of my freshman year of college. So at the end of my fresh, during my freshman year, um, actually, we went back to Nigeria for Christmas, and I was told by my members of my family, they found out about my sexuality, that, that this is not of our culture, and went through a lot of really traumatic events and series of events in Nigeria, right in the middle of my freshman year. So I came back from, I came back from Nigeria, and I really fell into a, lot, a spiral of a lot of anxiety and depression, really struggling with my, these two parts of my identity, being African and queer. And at the end of my freshman year, one of my friends, we were going to study actually at Oxford for a Duke and Oxford program. And one of my friends who I was going with was like, you know, we should get cameras and take pictures while we're there. And I was like, oh, sure. And so I got, I got a camera. And when I picked up the camera, I mean, I tell people, you know, kind of the story in jest, but it's like, you know, I really felt like I found a voice again. You know, I really felt like I found a vehicle for ex expression. And I did photography as a hobby during college. And then after college, 
I did a Fulbright, actually kind of how we connected. I did a Fulbright in Taiwan, which is where I did my first kind of major photography project. But it kind of really, the source of it was me really looking for a space of expression due to that tension between my sexuality and my African identity. Right, well, I'd love, I'd really love to um, hear um, the, I'll get, I'll, I see you, I'll get the, Theo, would you like to ask the next question then? Sure, I'd love to. Um, Michael, your work is absolutely beautiful. Um, it's it's amazing um, <laughs> to really see the universe in these bodies. It's it's pretty stunning and breathtaking. Um, I'm really super fascinated about your process and how you actually. So it was nice to see the photo um, in natural lighting. How do you actually proof your work and how do you go through the process of um, really checking? It? I mean, it looks like you can't even see the paint as it's on the body and yet you have really defined color locations and placement and it, it seems like a really difficult um, process to really visualize in, in its um, pre-illuminated format. So mm -hmm. if you could talk about that a little, I'd, be, I'd love to hear how you do that. Yeah, so for the images, actually what I use is, so I have my fluorescent paints, but then I have a black light flashlight. So as I'm painting the bodies, I also use my black light flashlight to check the locations and then I, then I iterate. So I'll kind of like, I'll be using it. I'll, I'll pull it up. I'll make patterns and then I'll keep going and I'll layer on in that way. So the black light flashlight does have bleed into the ultraviolet spectrum. So it allows me to also kind of check as I'm going. And then when I actually go into actually taking the images, I'm able to look on the actual back of the camera at that point to then look. And then I can also still make adjustments with the paints there. So in, in that process, um, how much, uh, when you take a photo, are you doing a lot of post-production work on it or is it really um, the, the nature of the lighting renders the, the really rich um, contrasts between the color, the um, phosphorescing and then the background? Because the, the blacks are so deep and just really stunning. Yeah, so I use also um, a black backdrop too in the Im in each of the images to really kind of pull out the really stark contrast. Then the fluorescence then is able to then really kind of pull, like really create a ton of contrast because then it you have these small, it's totally dark room, black background, and then all you have are these specks, individual specks of light and fluorescence that actually come from the bodies. In terms of post-production, what I'm able to do is I'm able to also kind of play with the colors. So I'm able to make a yellow paint into, for example, like a red or an orange. And so that allows me to have flexibility so that I don't have to repaint the bodies every single time. Yeah, it's really neat. Um, I'll, I just wanted to say, um, well, actually I forgot my question, so I'll just pass. <laughs> <laughs> you can, you can feel free to jump in again and ask. That's <laughs> um, really stunning work. Thank you for sharing. Oh, I know what I was going to say. Um, I love hearing your, your thoughts about the work and what it means to you and all the research that you put into um, bringing the mythos of your lineage into the imagery. It's, it's really fascinating. It makes the, the interaction with the art so much richer and deeper. So thank you for sharing oh, that. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That means a lot. <laughs> All right, thank you, Theo. Um, and so I'd love to hear a little about working with the models, um, who like how you got people um, to be involved. And then um, obviously you're working with models who are wearing like very little to no clothes. So what it's mm -hmm. like building trust um, in that sort of very intimate space. Yeah, so when, so all the shoots are nude photo shoots and with the, where the paints are then applied to the bodies. And so um, so when I first began doing the work, actually, I was actually just doing portraits. So the works were not completely nude. When I moved transition to the body series, those are completely nude portraits. So when I, the first images that I took from the series, I did with 
close or with friends and people I'd also collaborated with on my previous series, One of Those Africans. So I was able to, I already knew we had a sense of rapport and trust. And that was a really roughly foundational in the pieces. Also for each of the photo shoots, I invite each the models to bring a friend or family member with them. And so the friend or family member acts as the photo assistant for the shoots. So, you know, when I take them, when the lights are turned off, the photo assistant or their friend or family member is there turning the lights off. And then I then take the, the take, each, take each of the photos. And so I think that's also a really important part of the actual relationship is actually having somebody that they trust and know really well there. And I also, you know, I don't really just run into just doing the photo shoots. So I usually have a, almost like an informational session with the models, usually like two to three weeks ahead of time where we talk through the process. I tell them about my vision for the work. If they're in Pittsburgh, I invite them to the studio to see the work and to see um, it actually in terms of in the printed medium. And we, then we have, a con we have a conversation and just make sure that everybody feels 110% safe and comfortable with each other. And then I also invite them, of course, to then bring their friend or family member with them too for the shoots. So I think that's a part of it, but it does require, you know, I think it's really important to really build that relationship ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And so do the models, um, do they get a choice in like which story they are being depicted in or are they just, um, sort of putting themselves in your hands to, um, I guess, pose them into whichever narrative. Yeah, so a lot of the, yeah, so the the research and narrative selection is done by me, yeah. Right, and then um, you start, so you started this project um, as a response to counter the pervasive media images of, the, of black bodies being brutalized. Um, and you're creating an alternative image for Black people to see themselves as embodying the cosmos. I want to know what are some of the reactions you've gotten um, that have stuck out to you from your models or from mm -hmm. other Black people viewing your work? Mm -hmm. So one of the reactions that I think is, I mean, I think oh, there's a few. So I think I'll take two of them, you know, for, for concision. So, um, or to be concise, um, pardon me. So the one of the images in the prizer show is the image of the nomosemi the garden in space the one that's yellow and blue the arms are up etc and so the model for that image was um their name is mm and they were also a model for me in my limitless african series so i'd worked with them previously there good friends and so we did the photo shoot took the images and then afterwards we were looking at the pictures on the back of the camera and M.M. saw the pictures and began crying and M.M. told me that their entire life they had dreamt of you know seeing themselves as a celestial body as being adorned with stars and that this was beyond their wildest imagination and M.M. told me that every black person deserves to see themselves in this way. I think that was one of the phrases that kind of think really, really struck with me that I give it every black person, you know, the power of that self image, that divine self image. Um, so I think that was one of the reactions. And then I think in terms of public reactions from, from non models looking at the work was there was a 60 year old black woman who was like heavier set, et cetera, who saw an NPR article which shared my, shared my work and my images. And in the article, there was also featured one of my like heavier set models for the Infinite Essence series. And um, Annette um, is her name. Annette sent me an email and it's, it's publicly, it's, she, she said I could share the, the narrative, et cetera, and um, post it on my Instagram. And she told me that her entire life, she had hated her body. And for the first time in her 60 years, when she saw that image of, um, Uche, who's the model, when she saw when she when Annette saw that image, she finally, for a minute, for a moment, was able to take a breath and felt, you know, actually okay with herself. And even though it was temporary, that that was that was a moment that she never had in her entire life. And so I think that was also a reaction that has really stayed with me in terms of how these images can, you know, propose an uh, propose an alternative vision for Black people in terms of seeing our, our self-conception. 
that's really powerful and that must be very just incredible for you to experience as the artist um, mm. I, I want to point out there's actually two acts of reclamation happening in your work because you're also countering a historical bias in photography um, mm -hmm. because specifically like films original development um, you best captured like lighter skin tones. Um, can you speak on how you see um, photographers today countering that bias? Mm, interesting. Yeah, I think there's, I mean, I think in terms of the historical piece, you know, the that one of the, the foundations of American cinema is Birth of a Nation, you know, which was a film, you know, celebrating the KKK and demonizing black people. So that's really the foundation of American cinema, cinematic culture. The, as you mentioned about Kodak film, et cetera, like the film actually could not capture black and brown skin tones. And so the piece around like in terms of the, the contemporary moment, yeah, I mean, I think there's been, even historically though, black photographers have been doing incredible innovations within the medium of photography to tell our stories. One, um, I was listening to a talk um, at the Whitney, a virtual talk at the Whitney, I wasn't there, a virtual talk at the Whitney um, a few months ago, and they were talking about the work of James Vanderzee, um, really famous, acclaimed Harlem Renaissance photographer, Black Harlem Renaissance photographer, and his, his, his photographs of the Harlem Renaissance are just incredible. I mean, he's one of my favorite photographers, so if anybody's not seen James Vanderzee, look up James Vanderzee. Oh my God, love him. Um, and so he, but one of the things I was pointed out was because the photographic film that was available at the time could not capture the tonalities of the red tonalities in black and brown skin tones that within his actual chemistry that was actually done in terms of the black, the black room, he used certain, certain chemicals to bring out the tones that the standard, the standard fi um, film was not able to do. And so those are kind of ingenious inventions and, mo and um, innovations that black photographers have been doing since the, you know, the inception of photography. And so I think continuing into this day, you know, there's I, our road as black photographers, contemporary black photographers have been paved by so many greats. And I think now it's even, it's so exciting because there's so many young Black photographers continuing to come into the medium and really innovate and really celebrate our lives and our stories. And so you've moved away from labeling your work. I read somewhere you moved away from labeling your work as Afrofuturism. Um, and you've instead opted more to um, identify with astro Black mythology. Is that correct? Hmm. Um, yeah. So, so, yeah, I mean, the thing is that, like, I, understand the categorization of my work uh, with other Afrofuturist artists. So I'm not saying that people can't you know, categorize my work however they want to categorize my work. I would, I would, I think in that article, what I was more evoking was how I feel so much a personal kinship for my work with the term Astro Black mythology. And specifically that evokes a Sun Ra poem and Sun Ra, a song by Sun Ra the jazz musician who also is really kind of seen as being a forebear to many quote unquote Afrofuturist artists. But um, Sun Ra was talking about astro black mythology and in it, the astro part of course evoked the stars and celestial bodies, astrology. Um, black also brings in, you know, the black, the primordial blackness at the origin of the universe. You know, we can also think of black evoking ancient Egypt, which Sun Ra was very much situating his, his, his work and his tradition within an Egyptian mythological tradition. And so in ancient Egypt, the word Kemet, which is the word they actually used to describe themselves, meant the black land. And so astro, black, black evoking the black land, the blackness of the first people, the blackness of outer space, and then mythology evoking a system of knowledge, you know, that's connecting to, you know, art, science, and then spiritual science and religion to elevate human consciousness through the vehicle of mytho mythological systems. And so that interface between the three, which is evoked by Sun Ra, I feel like really kind of speaks to my work because I engage really specifically with mythologies as well um, versus just you know futuristic narratives solely. And so I think there's an engagement of course with Afrofuturism 
I think there I see more of a situation I, I see more of a positionality for myself with that Astro Black mythology. And so I really want to know um, more about uh, your experience doing a self portrait with this work um, mm -hmm. and what that was like for you. So the self portrait was hard. <laughs> I mean, I think all the technical aspects were hard. It being totally black and darkness and taking pictures. And I think also I'm taking the pictures and I'm dealing with like internalized body dysmorphia and all these different things are kind of coming up. I'm like naked. It's just so much going on. Painting, I'm all alone. It's dark, it's cold. So there was a lot happening, I would say, when I took the portrait. Also painting yourself is really hard, I would say. Painting your own body, getting your back, like very difficult. Those are, okay, so I'll say those are technical aspects. So I would say, okay, I went through that. I was like there for three hours taking the portraits. And I also was really great being able to understand the experience of the models actually going through the process and going through the work. So I was like, okay, I have a better understanding now. And when I actually looked at the images and then was working with the images, I they really challenged me to see a aspects of beauty in myself that I was really surprised about and that I didn't expect and anticipate. And I think it was in that kind of connection of my body to these celestial bodies. And then also, while I was looking at the images, reflecting on my own ancestral legacies. And so there was there's this interface of each flash going off and then this glowing body emerging from the blackness and then disappearing again. And in that, in that mode, I feel, I, I see, even when I'm watching as a, as a photographer, I see like a glimpse of kind of the soul or the spirit kind of opening up and revealing itself and then disappearing. So there's this aspect of dimension travel that's also happening, this movement across um, planes, across space and time that's happening. And in that moment when the flash is going off, there's also a conversation happening with ancestral legacies. And so I think all of that stuff was happening as I was actually doing the photograph myself, taking the photographs myself, so I could actually experience that. So yeah, I think that's was what I felt. You know, it was kind of starting the technical issues and then trying to kind of find and transform my own relationship with my body and then understanding also those ancestral legacies. So I think that was kind of happening in the midst of that self-portrait session. I think one of the really beautiful things about this project is the way it can change the way people move um, through through the world. Um, and how, I want to know um, your like your um, personal experience and how this project, how doing that self portrait affected the way you move through the world. Hmm. That's a great question. I hmm, good question. I feel like the versus it being from the self-portrait, I think at least at this moment, what I can more so identify is the shifts that have come throughout the project as a whole from its starting point to now. So beginning the work in 2016 to now, I think it's easier for me to kind of trace that because it's like a large, longer time span. And within that space, I think I've also, I've, I've changed a lot and I think the main reason for that is the engagement with African myth and understanding that in all of our lives, we're, we're, re, we're living myths and mythology every single day. And it's like, which myths are we choosing to live? And so engaging with African myths and mythologies which have sustained humanities for hundreds of thousands of years, that's also been really, really nourishing for me it's really shifted the way in which I see my own relationship with my work, I think is kind of was really, really important. And also with, you know, my, I guess my, my longer, on the long scale, like my, my purpose here with what I'm doing and why I'm making the work that I do, what's the point of it. And so I think that has been very, very transformative in terms of actually just making this, this really, this work that's really connected to African spiritual science. 
And you've said your art is for yourself first and foremost, um, that it provides, um, that it first and foremost needs to provide a sort of internal healing for you. Um, mm -hmm. Well, how does your relationship with these pieces and these projects change as your needs change? Um, and as you change as a person. And I'm curious, what do you find yourself needing now? Mm -hmm. mm, great question. Um, it's it has changed a lot. So when I be first began the series, it was more from an engagement with thinking about quote unquote the body in the larger in the larger in the, the larger sense. But actually, it's in a much smaller sense because it's really a focus on form without kind of these larger understandings of what the form means. And so by that, I mean that when I began, I was kind of just trying to respond to these media images by recapturing and re kind of recasting or transfiguring the black bodies. Um, and it, I was not, I was, I had the, in the Chimuachibe quote, but I didn't have larger context and I'm still learning. I mean, I'm still learning and really deeply and trying to engage and so I think that's kind of the biggest change was kind of, first it was more of an engagement with the idea of form and the black body and what that can mean and from a celestial standpoint, and then shifting it to really grounding it within African mythologies was a huge shift um, in terms of my own conceptualization of myself, of the work, how I see the work and what the work is doing for me. And so, Versus it just seeing it as, oh, a starry image of a black body. Oh, that's nice, you know, seeing it as retelling a myth of the origin of the universe, which connects us to blackness as a divine cosmic force. You know, it's in versus it just kind of trying to respond to a contemporary understanding of blackness as this really flat polit socio-political construct to this cosmic substance that creates all life and existence. And I feel like engaging with that <laughs> also transforms my own relationship with my own blackness, with my own life and how I produce the work. So I think that mythological shift was a really big difference for me. And that's, I think definitely also accelerated with the, um, the murder of George Floyd. And just, I think there, again, I really, turn to African mythologies as the basis for my own sanity and health and mental health and emotional and spiritual health at, at that time. All right, and so um, I wanna get to some of the questions that have been piling up in these last 10 minutes. Um, okay, cool. Bad about cool. managing this chat. Um, so <laughs> Noel wanted to ask that one of the photo one of the photos of the figures with the emphasis on the joints um, yeah. remind, reminds me of Blasco, um, B-L-A-S-C-H-K-O, um, Blasco's lines on the body. Um, and they were wondering if you know of them. I actually do not. So I will, I will look that up. I will look that up. Yeah. And then yeah. I actually, when I was, when I was, when I was, when I was taking the image, I mean, I, I'll look up the Blasco reference, but um, I did think about um, Da Vinci's Vitruvian Man, and in, um, in the Vitruvian Man, um, Vitruvius, the Roman architect, was positing the idea that the quote-unquote ideal proportions of the human body reflect the ideal proportions of a temple. And that that evocation there spoke to me at the time. And so I was exploring that and then regrounding the work within an African cosmological context. And now, um, Rachel, uh, you have a question? Yeah, sorry. I just like, I'm really bad with the words. So I didn't want to like take a whole paragraph in the chat. Um, well, first I wanted to say your work is beautiful, especially um, I appreciate the portrayal of um uh the black men in your work because we rarely see black men as like graceful and soft and so and the, like beautiful right like there's always like this tone around black men so I super appreciate that um being represented in your work and I wanted to ask you um and sort of the trick of my question of this idea of 
you being able to name and know your ethnic group and your um, identity in Africa and also navigating the state, like the space in the US where a lot of black Americans don't know their ancestral roots. And so what does that mean for you being born in the US but also knowing your identity and being able to display that in your work and also that representation for folks and being able to sort of reclaim their identity and sort of identify with your work? That's a good question. I, hmm. So, hmm. Can you specify the question? So I guess, I guess, so yeah. Can you just like kind of reiterate or kind of specify it? Yeah. Sure. So I think it's a twofold question of like for you personally mm -hmm. being able, mm -hmm. like being a Black man in America, but also knowing your ethnic identity um, mm -hmm. and what that has meant for your work and being able to navigate that mm -hmm. space and represent that, as well as the mm -hmm. response from folks, um, particularly Black Americans who may not know their ethnic origins, right, because it's been robbed from them, um, how they've been yeah. able to identify and respond to your work if it was different from your answer from earlier. Oh, okay, yeah. So I would say for me, um, with my, I think my res, I think my research process began with looking at Igbo heritage and Igbo cosmologies. You know, looking at Chinua Achebe's work and then his reflections on the soul and the spirit. And so I think for me, that was my entry point into thinking about the work. I don't think though that that is an exclusive experience to. Being like being from the African continent, you know, there are many esoteric traditions that are indigenous to African African Americans, descend African American descendants of slaves in this country. You know, we can look at, for example, the Gullah Geechee and like their esoteric traditions. And um, one of the myths that I evoked is also an African American myth. And so I think there are also there are many many ways that people can kind of access it. And I think that one of the, I think there is, of course, you know, I think there, I think there are, there are absolutely, there are, there are differences in the ways in which we have access to our own heritage and lineage. Um, I think that, because um, I'm not sure if this is exactly what you're asking, but I think that for people across the diaspora, including, you know, in the United States, everybody has equally valid legacies as the like, American descendants of slaves, et cetera, where they can also access the work. And so I actually have never, I've not felt like um, different audiences of black people have been able to, not been able to access the work, et cetera. Because I think even for example with Igbo people, my own family members don't know our own mythologies. You know, I, so I think there's, I think many people, I mean, even for me, I had to, I didn't, I couldn't learn these myths from my own family members. I had to learn them from doing research. And so I think there's an engagement from the work from that kind of the form perspective. But then I think that mythological element, I think many people are coming in without having really much knowledge about that, that space, um, no matter where they're from. So I think, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but yeah. Yeah, I think that's kind of a, does that help a little bit? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, um, and so we've got, just got a few more questions here. Um, so, oh, I just lost one. Um, uh, Liz asked, um, they were curious about the choice to print on metal, both how that is done and mm -hmm. its meaning in the work. Yeah, so I work with a fabricator to actually do the printing on metal and so, they use a technique of actually dye sublimating the images onto metal plates. And so they, they're actually affixed onto the metal plates. And then it's, so it's not dye bond where it's actually like a print paint, uh, glued onto metal. It's actually, the, it's actually the, the, the print substrate is actually in the, on the metal surface itself. And so the choice for it, you know, I was thinking at the beginning, I was experimenting with a few different print media and when I when I looked at the metal, it really just was really fantastic. And then I was then reflecting on our African mytho mythological traditions and the presence of these divine smiths and smithing. 
And I was thinking about in the Igbo context, we have a long smithing tradition connected to the site Igbo Uku, where they have these bronze, bronze metallurgy. You're talking about metals and cosmic substance and these divine traditions that then came together in terms of like, I just, when I saw the metal, I was like, oh, this is why you know I'm, I'm here and I'm doing it. I think also the metal, some of the other thing interesting is things working with metal, particularly a softer metal like aluminum, is that it's it looks really strong, but it's also really fragile. And so, you know, one time I actually kind of bumped one of the prints against the wall and the actual corner bent. And I started thinking about the fragility of the of the black body, you know, and how, you know, connecting it to, of course, this thin, powerful substance, but also one that's really, really fragile and the need to protect it. So that was kind of, these are all kind of things that I was meditating on in terms of the, uh, the selection of the medium. And so um, set penultimate question, second to last question, I promise, um, is do you see yourself um, from DNA art, um, whoever, whatever the username is, um, do you see yourself showing your work in Africa um, and the possibility of um, engaging with the communities there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I would definitely be open to that and I would be really excited about that opportunity um, because like, I mean, as I said before, like many of my own family members don't know these mythologies. And so I think that would be a really, really powerful venue to share these stories. And then my last question um, is what- well, Oh, would... I, th I saw Liz, Liz raised, raised, raised their hand. Yeah. You can uh, raise your hand. Are you sure? Liz. Do you want to ask your question, Liz? It, no, it, the, the, let's hear Lily's question, no. <laughs> okay. I was just gonna ask, I wanted to give everyone the opportunity to know what you're working on next. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in the past year, I've been working on my first film, which is a From the Infinite Essence Universe. It's like a 30, about 30 minute choreographed dance performance, which retells one of these Igbo myths of creation. And so that film will be coming out in September in my, in my New York show there. So kind of stay tuned for details on that. I have a film that I'm working on, and then I also have some new images from the FFSN series that are also going to come out in September. So yeah, so those are kind of the two pieces there. All right. Um, well, that concludes our uh, artist talk today. Mikhail, thank you so, so much for joining us. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> virtual claps all around. Um, you can still, you can see his work, um, Infinite Essence at Paizo until May 8th. So you've got plenty of time. You can see it at, at night. I personally recommend it at night because it's just glow. It's literally glowing. Um, or make an appointment in the day at, um, Carrie, would you drop the link in the chat one more time? Because uh, people had so many good questions there. It's gonna be, I don't want them to have to scroll too far. <laughs> But thank you all so much for coming. Thanks, everyone.